How's it going, everybody? I'm Eli Niver, I'm the Associate Director of IT and Production at the Ann Arbor District Library. And uh, my talk today is called uh, More Kitchen, Less Grocery, Finding Value for a 21st Century Library. So in the beginning of libraries, we had this. You know, this was the first library. It was a really easy thing to use because you just had to go into the right cave. You know, this was the right, this was the first sort of form of stored expression when ideas stopped being just in our heads and had some way of having some real permanence. This was a big change for humans. Ideas weren't just oral anymore. They weren't just something that had to move from one to another. About 20,000 years later, mobile technology hit the scene and shook everything up. Suddenly, the, the information was no longer glued to the wall in an individual cave, could now move around, which meant that it had copies, and the copies became something precious, and libraries became critical parts of preserving civilization, because these documents were where civilization was stored. About 200 years later, or I'm sorry, 2,000 years, this was 20,000 years to the scroll, 2,000 years from the scroll to ENIAC and the, uh, the birth of the electronic computer because we had so much information, our civilization was producing so much stuff that we were requiring all kinds of new information. Then 20 years after ENIAC, we had ARPANET, the first few four nodes. And in December 1969, the first computers were talking to each other in interstate, as the first WAN, and it was a big breakthrough. And here we are, something, you know, about 40 years later than that, and this is what we got at libraries. You know, it's, it's just an idea, I'm just a search engine, I'm just here to find things for you. Well, the issue is, this is not the future of libraries, because Google is not going to get any dumber as time goes on. And the whole notion of reference as being later, or I'm sorry, 2000, and to answer the question for you, it's completely done and dead. Now, librarians have a hard time recognizing it. However, there is still a great value in libraries, because libraries are a great place to take that stuff on the top and turn it into the stuff at the bottom. Take all those CDs, check them out from the library, rip them into your iTunes, and then take them back. I'm not advocating this, nor am I a legal counsel, but the, opinion, the thought is that the content and the collections can be an excellent point of value for libraries, but look at this. Is this all that a library is? Vending machine? Something else to put in? Is this all that you have left? The content circulation model is not a future for libraries. Content circulation is a 20th century model. We have 21st century problems in libraries, and content circulation is not going to be it. Now, one thing that is, is a big part of libraries kind of like the grocery store model. You know, you go and you browse all the stuff on the shelf. This is, a, what's it called, Kidoozle. Have you ever heard of Kidoozle? It's this crazy thing in Memphis, an automated vending machine grocery store. You punch your card, and then there were these elaborate machines that dispensed it from these, uh, and it just didn't work very well. So maybe what we need in libraries is a little less grocery and a little more kitchen. And here you have kind of a kitchen library designed by Philip Stark. It's a very cool idea, kind of the notion of combining things, because when you go into a kitchen, you're not just taking things, you're using them, you're making something new. Uh, unfortunately, for a lot of media, the, to, to make a media kitchen, you need a lot of this kind of stuff. And right now in libraries, most libraries are not in a position to make this kind of investment and have this kind of stuff available. The other fact is that a lot of what goes on in libraries is essentially social work. And that doesn't match well with multi-thousand dollar worth of pieces of equipment. So a lot of different ways that a library can provide value to its users, especially users who are makers and getting value for that. So you can see here, this was uh, the yarn harlot, Stephanie Pearl McPhee. She came, 450 knitters came. She was three hours late. It didn't matter. They had their knitting. Dale came later. This was something that uh, we had uh, recently. It was called Comic Book Academy. Get young people in the door who are interested in finding out about something and give them a structured experience, but it's not school. School is not a place where any kid wants to learn, except for the kids that already come to libraries. We got them. You don't have to worry about that. So Comic Book Academy, that was a great thing. Now, another thing that's been really big is duct tape and sort of the kicky crafts. There's all kinds of stuff out there in the show floor. You've got uh, Amigurumi and the, the whole duct tape prom thing. This is awesome. It's becoming cool for teenagers to make their own clothes. Are you crazy? You know how far away from that we got? And now, all of a sudden, they're wearing this to, to prom. Another thing we've done at the library's Library Lego League, which is a competitive robotics event, kind of like FIRST, but it only takes one day. You can get into it, and you can get out of it. And parents who aren't that engaged in their kids wanting to learn these things can come and drop them off as opposed to having any type of commitment that it takes for a parent to have their kid be at first. So a kid can indulge in this without their parent's full support. Another thing that we've done in the conjunction with the wonderful, young, enthusiastic idealists at All Hands Active is this wonderful, great event called Rec Lab and Make Lab. You saw some Rec Lab out there on the floor, and we had some really awesome intergenerational learning between makers. A dad who's an engineer showing the whole duct tape prom thing. This is off a part, put it back together, see what you do. And kids of all ages, even girls, are coming to make this stuff. One of our Rec Lab Make Labs was about clothing. 
in. We just went to a Salvation Army, stocked up with a bunch of junk, brought it in, and this girl made, you can't quite see it on the slide, but she cut up one of those ugly wolf ties, and she made an awesome apron out of it. You know, kind of like the three wolves howling at the moon. It was a very, very good reuse of that material. At the third session of uh, Rec Lab and Make Lab, we took some old library equipment that was headed for the scrap heap anyway, and let kids with mohawks destroy laser printers. I just wish I had taken out the toner before they got into it. But uh, it's, again, a great multi-generational, the whole family. You've got a four-year-old girl, a 12-year-old boy, their eight-year-old middle child, and the dad, all working together, making a really great Libraries is you have lots of excellent contests. We have this Lego contest now every year. It's uh, it's grown up to we get 200 entries. We had to add an adults category because the adults were complaining that they weren't allowed to enter. So we've done that this year. That's this Thursday at Weber's out in Ann Arbor. This Thursday at Weber's. So you also have an anime contest. We have a graffiti contest every year during art fair. It's a really great thing. And then this, this is the Big Dragon. It won an Editor's Choice Award right here at Maker Fair just earlier today. It's an awesome project where kids basically learn how to use a pop riveter and put stuff together onto these five dollar buckets and we took them all together we made a 25 foot long dragon and tomorrow it'll be 30 feet long so come see it in the courtyard over there see it out on the library get the library card and help us keep going into the future thanks a lot thank you eli